Welcome to the second day of the fourth week of the Romanian Global Quantum Program. We will have a hardware day today. We will start with a hardware lecture on trapped ion quantum computing. Yesterday, we saw a little bit about trapped ion quantum computing in the virtual lab tour by IonQ. Today, we will get a thorough introduction by Christoph Wunderlich from Electron and the University of Siegen. Then we will have a virtual reality lab tour by Katrin Spendier from Quantinium. And after that, a quantum computing hardware panel with representatives from Quantinium, IQM, Quera, Quantum Brilliance, and the National Quantum Computing Center in the UK. So get ready for an exciting session and have your questions ready for today on threat ion quantum computing and for the hardware panel. Yes, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Today is particularly exciting um, because the topic of today is trapped ion quantum computing, which happens to also be my area of research. Today we are joined by Professor Wunderlich, who is one of the world experts in trapped ion quantum computing. I remember when I started my PhD, I read this paper on um, long wavelength quantum logic using trapped ion computers that was written by him and another colleague, Florian Mintert. Um, Professor Wunderlich um, finished his PhD at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and today he is the um, he is a professor of experimental physics at uh, the University of Siegen. He is also the founder and the CEO of his own startup quantum computing company, Electron. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you so much for your invitation to speak here. Trapped ion quantum computing is, of course, a wide field, and having 45 minutes to introduce it, uh, it's, you have to make some choices, and I made a choice to keep it hopefully reasonably simple. Uh, in So a, simple means accessible to people with different backgrounds, so um, yeah. Okay, so let me start with uh, a slide that goes back uh, more than 100 years just for introductory purposes. So when we think about uh, quantum technology today, we often hear that it's the second quantum revolution. And if we think back, when did quantum physics actually start? So it was maybe around 1900 when Max Planck came up with his famous constant. And then quantum physics was extremely um, successful and in explaining natural phenomena and also in building devices. So uh, the first transistor, for instance, relies on quantum effects. And also the first laser relies on quantum effects. And I mean, today's world would not be conceivable without transistors and lasers. Um, they appear everywhere, basically in industry and in research. So <clears throat> yes, um, but so they rely on quantum effects, but on collective quantum effects, just to remind you here, uh, so, so it's not individual quantum systems that play a role. It's always an ensemble of quantum systems. And Alvin Schrödinger, he's still in the 50s. He uh, told people and was convinced that it is so that we never will be able to experiment with just a single quantum system, like one electron or one atom. And um, But this changed dramatically, and there's an exact date when this changed. So it's the on the 17th of April in 1979. So this was the date when for the <clears throat> first time a human observed a single atom, a single quantum system. And then uh, many developments set in or were going on in parallel. And today we have the second quantum revolution that really relies on, um, on the availability of individual quantum systems and being able to manipulate individual quantum systems. So just to uh, give you a bit more detail about this. So we had Schrödinger who said we, We'll never do this, have just one quantum system. 
and then I gave you the exact date when this changed. So why can I give you this date? Because uh, here, that's the <clears throat> person who saw the first single atom with his own eyes. And that's from his lab notebook. So you notice lab notebooks are very important. Um, so where he noted that he observed one, two, or three individual trapped ions. So that was the first time an individual quantum system was, uh, an individual atom was observed, to put it more precisely. And so this was done uh, in the group of Peter Toschek in Heidelberg. And uh, the experiment was initiated by Hans Demelt, who uh, not so much later received the Nobel Prize for his work on uh, trapping individual ions. So that's, um, yeah, Hans Demelt, he initiated these experiments. Wolfgang Paul, uh, he developed a technique that finally led to, um, to trapping individual atoms. And yeah, so they were rewarded the Nobel Prize for this about 10 years later already. And then um, the development as far as individual atoms and trapped ions are concerned continued. And so David Weinland and Sasha Roche, they uh, received the Nobel Prize in 2012 for their yeah, groundbreaking methods to uh, measure and manipulate individual quantum systems. So those were uh, people who decisively contributed to where we are today. Okay, so um, that's just for a brief reminder of how we got where we are today. And now let's start. Now we want to use trapped ions or we want to look at how trapped ions are going to be used for quantum computing. And so the remainder of this talk or the major part of this talk is developed to um, <clears throat> an introduction to using trapped ions for quantum computing. And then I will um, yeah, talk a bit more about a particular way of trapped ion quantum computing, which uses uh, so-called magnetic gradient induced coupling magic, where we can do trapped ion quantum computing using radio frequency radiation instead of laser light. Okay, so let's start with the longest part of this talk. So that's the introduction to trapped ions for quantum computing. Okay, so if we want to trap ions, we first need an ion trap. And um, can you see my mouse, by the way? Okay, I see somebody nodding. Yeah, very good. Excellent. So, um, so here we have a, a very generic Paul trap. So we just saw Wolfgang Paul who Paul who invented this type of trap. So we have four electrodes, and now we cut these electrodes uh, transverse to their longest extension, and then we see these four rods here. And now let's say we put a voltage. So we have this positive ion and we want to keep the ion there. And in order to do this, we keep, we do put these two rods on a positive voltage and these two on a negative voltage. And the resulting potential that we get is uh, this potential. So if this is the X direction, then along the x direction in this potential landscape, we we have an anti-binding potential. So, um, oops, let's go back. Yeah, we have an anti-binding potential, and um, now in the x direction we have a binding potential. So we switch the polarity here. So now this is positive, and this is positive. So the ion doesn't want to go in this direction, so it has to go up the hill, but it's unbound in this direction. And actually, there is a general theorem in physics, Earnshaw's theorem, that tells you that you cannot 
confine, uh, create a potential minimum or maximum in a charge-free region using only static potentials. So using you can play around a bit and try to find an arrangement with static potentials that will not work. But uh, if we change the polarity very quickly, so we change these two electrodes to plus and these two to minus, then we move this potential like this. So we move this up and down. And if we do this fast enough, our ion that sits in the middle just doesn't know where it's supposed to go and it will stay where it is in the middle. And in the end, you get um, an effective harmonic potential that confines the ion. Okay, so this is now the effective harmonic potential to con where the ions are confined. And so this is now in 2D, in two dimensions, I can find the ion, but in the third dimensions, they can still escape here. But then I use two additional, additional electrodes, this one and this one, to confine them also in the third direction. So we use a combination of static and dynamic potentials to confine the ions. Okay, so now we have ions in the trap, and now they they usually are still quite motionally excited. So they move around in the trap. Okay, but first uh, let me show you before I come to the movement of the of the ions. Let me show you how a, an actual ion trap today looks like what it looks like. So it's not this generic trap, but the principle is exactly the same. So on this picture, you see one of the traps that are used in the labs in Siegen, actually. So this is now a microstructured Paul trap, still a 3D trap. And for size comparison, you have this one cent piece, here, one euro cent. Yeah, which is uh, <clears throat> comparable in size to a dollar cent approximately. So uh, this is about 11 millimeters here to be more precise, this edge. So this is a microstructure trap with many electrodes, but the principle is still the same uh, that I just showed to you. And another notable thing here is that the vacuum recipient is very compact. So you don't really need huge vacuum recipients. Or, um, so it can be a very small and compact thing. And to show you another example of a microstructure trap. So that's one, a 2D trap now where all the electrodes are in, in on one surface. And so you see lots of electrodes. I'm not going to go into this. I just want to point out there's also a microwave resonator on this trap chip that uh, allows you to control your ions using microwave radiation. Okay, so these are just examples of today's traps. So <clears throat> they have developed quite a bit from what Paul Wolfgang Paul initially proposed. And now let's come back uh, to, <clears throat> to our ions. They are now confined in the trap, but they move around very fast. So now we need, we use laser cooling to actually to reduce their emotional uh, energy. And laser cooling, so this is a really a very basic introduction. So um, I'm not showing any formulas. I'm just pointing out this is a photon here. It carries momentum. So the length of this arrow is proportional, let's say, to its momentum that the photon carries. And this is our atom moving in this direction. And now the atom can absorb a photon. So it's, it also absorbs the momentum that, and 
for reasons of momentum conservation, which is one of the basic laws of physics, it reduces its momentum. So you bombard uh, this big, let's say, uh, bowling ball with some table tennis balls and each table tennis ball imparts a little bit of momentum and slows down the, the atom. Okay, but then you have to repeat this many times. So the atom has to emit a photon again. So then, but it emits in a random direction and then recoil imparts a recoil onto the atom. So the, the atom changes its direction of motion slightly. And then when you do this many times, on average, the atom typically emits isotropically. So the, the recoil of these photons, when emitted, they, they average out. And so there's a net force slowing down the atom. So by imparting momentum to the atom. Okay, so that's a, a very basic uh, brief introduction to laser cooling. So the nice thing about uh, trapped ions now is that you need them cold, but you only need the atoms, the ions cold, not the whole apparatus. So this is a, an interesting feature of trapped ions. Now let me show you some a little movie, so where we trap ions, so this is one, two, and then three, four, five, up to 10, I believe. So, <clears throat> so here we used uh, this trap that I just showed you, this microstructure trap, and we laser cooled the ions, and then they form such a nice crystal, and, they, and then they are ready to be, uh, yeah, they are ready for quantum computing, basically. But yeah, there are still a few more steps to go. So this is an example of a, that's now, I believe, 33 ions uh, sitting in a nice chain. So they are trapped, as I explained before, by a radio frequency field and static voltages, and they are laser cooled and yeah. Okay. And okay, so this is a little movie showing how you can then move around your ions in such a trap so you can make them wiggle around. So this is very slow so that our eyes can follow it. Yeah, so, and then you can move them to different places in the trap. And wherever you need your qubits. Okay, so to summarize what I said so far, we have some trap that confines these singly charged atomic ions. Then we scatter laser light. This laser light also serves the purpose to make the ions visible. So that's why we can see them here now. Of course, this is a camera image, false color coded. So here, red means high intensity. Um, <clears throat> yes, so we have some transition in our ion where we scatter lots of laser light to cool the ion and to make it visible. Okay, so, so far, no qubits. But, so we need some additional states, internal states of our ions that serve as qubits. And that's what I will show next. So we choose two long-lived states in our ion and call them a qubit. I mean, you have certainly seen already quite a few other physical realizations of qubits. So these are two energy levels uh, that we suitably choose. And then, one element that we need for quantum computing is, of course, detecting, state selectively detecting the qubits. And this works by um, doing a projective measurement by scattering laser light. So 
if our ion is in this qubit state, we do scatter light, so we see the ion. If it's in this qubit state, we do not scatter light, so no ion visible. And so this is a, an excellent projective measurement, and state detection fidelities with many nines have been realized for uh, detecting ions. <clears throat> okay, so that's now one ingredient that we need for quantum computing uh, is to detect the ion and to prepare its state initially. That's also done using laser light. But then, um, of course, we need um, we need if we want to do we want to do a quantum algorithm, and then we need to manipulate to coherently control um, our trapped ions. Okay, so um, now I realize. Okay, my slides are in the wrong order, but never mind. I'll just go through this slide, which is one of the final slides, actually. Okay, so now we need um, we need. For quantum computing, we need to coherently control uh, our two qubit states. And so you all of you know by now that quantum computing can be realized by having two basic ingredients as far as coherent control is concerned, as far as quantum gates are concerned. You need at least single qubit gates and certain types of two qubit gates. So if you have these two ingredients, then you can synthesize any quantum algorithm. So it's the task of the experimenter is basically to demonstrate single qubit gates and two qubit gates. And then you can say you're done. Of course, um, it's not that simple, but um, these, in principle, these two ingredients are sufficient together with state preparation and state detection and <clears throat> for synthesizing any quantum algorithm. So now, single qubit gates. So when you want to do a single qubit gates with your trapped ions, so we have now here we have three trapped ions. Typically, the spacing between them is a few micrometers. And now you want to, to do a manipulation of only one of these ions. So you want to drive, let's say, this middle qubit or the qubit on this side. And you want to implement a coherent superposition of your qubit state. So you focus radiation on one of on just one of them on one of the ions something is wrong here with my the order of my slides interesting yeah okay well um yes so for single qubit gates you need to focus your electromagnetic radiation radiation on just one ion and if you now remember the diffraction limit from your early physics studies um, the diffraction limit tells you that the focal spot to which you can focus your electromagnetic radiation radiation is on the order of the wavelength of your radiation and if we have now five a five micrometer distance between the ions and we want our focal spot to be much smaller than this we need optical radiation so that's one reason why people use exclusively laser light for um, manipulating trapped ions so to to be able to do single qubit gates on arbitrary qubits and independent single qubit gates okay so now so this is one ingredient 
And the second ingredient is now two qubit gates. So now let's look at two qubit gates and hopefully this. Hmm. Um, for some reason, yeah, here it goes. So um, for two qubit gates, you need a means of the qubits to communicate. And their quantum bus, so uh, 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 that the, our trapped ions use to communicate is the common vibrational motion. So uh, we just saw this in this little animation. So we excite um, this one ion and then we transfer momentum. So as in laser cooling, we transfer momentum to the ion and then the whole ion string starts to move because uh, there's a Coulomb interaction, of course. So if this ion moves, it pushes away this ion and this ion, and then they all start to move. So any other ion in the string noticed that something that this ion actually changed its qubit state because it absorbed uh, a quantum, a momentum, a quantized momentum. And now if you do the math and calculate how much momentum you need to, uh, to set the ion string in motion, you realize that it's again uh, in the optical regime. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher is the momentum associated with a photon. And so you need short wavelengths, typically in the optical regime, to be able to transfer enough momentum here to uh, enable this quantum bus. Okay, so these are. Um, and I'm not showing you now exactly the mechanism that gives you, for instance, a C not gate. Um, if you do this in a clever way, this conditional dynamic, you can realize a C not gate or other interesting gates. So, um, yes, yeah, so I just want to summarize here. So we uh, we need electrodynamic fields or yeah, to trap our ions in a pole trap. We need laser cooling to make them crystallize nicely. And then we need um, radiation to, uh, to manipulate our qubit. And for single qubit gates and two qubit gates. And now on the next slide, uh, there's a, this is a view of one of the labs of David Weinland. So he composed this slide uh, already quite a few years ago. So that's not an up-to-date lab, but it illustrates the point uh, that David Weinland wanted to make with this slide. Um, <clears throat> so you see this vast arrangement of optical elements of lasers and all kinds of optical things. And then you have uh, the the little ion trap somewhere. So the ion trap itself, if you look at this picture, it uh, gives you the impression that the ion trap itself is not really the complicated part in such experiments. It's the the laser light, the coherent laser light that you need to steer to control the ions. And uh, if you take a close look at such an optical table, what you realize is that, uh, so you generate light that is sent to your ions to control your ions, but the light generation is controlled <clears throat> mostly by radio frequency signals. So you generate your control signals in the radio frequency regime, then transfer them into the optical domain and then apply them to your trapped ions. And why is this done? Because of the two reasons I just meant, mentioned, because 
you need to individually address your qubits and you need to be able to set them in motion for conditional quantum gates. Okay, so now um, the, this magnetic gradient induced coupling that I mentioned in the beginning, that actually allows you to get rid of all the lasers and use not all of the lasers. I'll come to that point in a minute again. Uh, it allows you to replace all the lasers used for coherent manipulation by radio frequency sources. So radio frequency sources are extremely high developed. I mean, you probably all have a mobile phone that runs using microwaves and you have uh, signal generators, amplifiers, face locks, all kinds of fancy stuff in this little box in your pocket. Um, <clears throat> oops, what happened here now? And uh, yes, so this is a great technical reduction in uh, complexity when you can get rid of all the laser light to, for coherent control. You still need lasers for cooling and detection and preparation, but they are, in terms of frequency stability, for example, they are many orders of magnitude less complex uh, than, <clears throat> than the lasers you need for coherent control. So the line width of a of a qubit laser, let's say if you want to have one second coherence time, you need a, a relative a line width of one hertz and um, at an optical frequency of 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 15 hertz, this is a high, very ambitious um, stability that you want to achieve. So one part in 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 15, that's uh, quite ambitious for radio frequency radiation. This is uh, standard today to have one second coherence time or even 10 or 100 seconds. So, okay. Um, and now let me explain how this uh, magnetic gradient induced coupling works. So how, you, how, why can we get rid of lasers all of a sudden? And yes, so I'll explain that. Yeah. Okay, so now a bit more technical. So this is our favorite ion our, uh, that we use. So we have these uh, light fields that are used for cooling and detection, as I said before. So they have a line width of hundreds of kilohertz. So that's a very modest um, laser sources that you can buy off the shelf right now. And then all coherent things are done on this hyperfine transition in the microwave regime. So at here in this particular ion at 12.6 gigahertz. So all the control signals are generated and directly applied in the radio frequency or radio frequency includes microwaves. Okay, so how does this work now? So remember uh, these two hyperfine states, they represent a magnetic moment of your atom. So and if you put them into an external field, their energy depends on the orientation of this magnetic moment, completely analogous to a classical compass needle. So you have this magnetic moment, that's your compass needle or your atom, and you can either align this with the field or anti-align it. So you have two different energy states. And classically, of course, this needle can have any orientation, but from quantum experiments, we know that our atomic needle can have only two discrete outcomes and they are separated by some energy delta E. So I can rotate this, then I have to invest energy and I go from the lower state to the upper state. Okay, so that's a, a picture of our atoms. And now let's look at two atoms. And now we put them into uh, an inhomogeneous field. 
So this field, uh, this atom experiences um, a stronger field, so more dense magnetic field lines, and this is a weaker field, a weaker field. And so here you need to invest less energy to flip the needle, and here you need to invest more energy to flip the needle. And quantum mechanically, it means we have these discrete energy states. So, and this one has a smaller energy splitting than this one. And they correspond to different uh, transition frequencies. So if you want to bring, uh, you want to flip your needle, you have to have a higher frequency here. So that's Planck's constant than here. And so to show you an experiment that this really works. Um, so this is now three trapped ions here. And now we change the microwave frequency. They are in a microwave, in, in a magnetic field gradient. And they all have different resonance frequencies. So that works very nicely. This individual addressing in an inhomogeneous field. And in fact, it works uh, extremely well, so um, here, uh, this is shown now a quantum, here we show a quantum byte, individual addressing of a quantum byte, eight ions, so, um, and because the addressing error is so small, you need a, a particular method to, to benchmark how small this error is, so what is done here, oops, what is <clears throat> done here? Here we look at the errors that is the the error that is induced when we manipulate ion four and check what error happens on ion. No, yes, we manipulate ion four and check what error we uh, observe on ion five. So ideally, no error at all. But so we do about yeah more than 1000 gates on ion4 and observe the error that is introduced on ion5 and then from this we can deduce the single shot error which is the worst case here so that's 7.6 times 10 to the minus 5 for neighboring ions and for non neighboring ions uh it's even smaller, but yes, so in the 10 to the minus 5 range. So this addressing works extremely well with, uh, and okay, my slides are in a funny way, coming up in a funny way. Hmm. That's not what I wanted, but okay. Um, we can live with that. Yes. Okay, so and um, then this the complete uh, crosstalk matrix has been measured. Uh, so each so you get an eight by eight matrix um, where you can put in the crosstalk and it's all on the order of ten to the minus five, so well below typical thresholds that are necessary for error correction to be able to apply fault tolerant quantum computing to apply error correction. And yeah, so it doesn't only, it's not sufficient to only have high qubit, high fidelity gates, but you also need to keep your crosstalk small, of course. This is also part of the fidelity of your quantum algorithm in the, in the end. So you need high fidelity gates and small crosstalk. Okay, so, so this is individual addressing, but now how does this state, um, how does it work that we impart momentum to the ion with microwave radiation? So microwave radiation at 12.6 gigahertz, we are at uh, centimeter wavelengths compared to a few hundred nanometer wavelengths and the momentum is proportional to one over the wavelength. So we have a very long wavelength now, 
which means very small momentum, and this is just not sufficient to excite our ion by momentum transfer. But um, this magnetic field gradient allows you to nevertheless set your ion in motion in a hom inhomogeneous field. And that's what I'll show you here. So we have our inhomogeneous field, we have our needle here. So in the lower state, we go to higher fields. So this, uh, this energy state is lowered. And if we flip uh, our needle, then, yeah, I'll just flip it. So we go to the higher energy state, but now the, our atom, our needle finds itself on this slope here. So it's going to move to the left in this harmonic potential. So it's going to move to its new equilibrium position here. And so it changes its internal energy state. So we went from here, this splitting to this splitting. So we, again, what we do is we couple um, the internal state, so our qubit state, we couple this to the motional state of our ion. So then that's exactly what we need to do conditional quantum dynamics. So, and that's what we call magnetic gradient induced coupling. So you don't need to impart momentum. You simply change the equilibrium position of your ion. And now at this point, I'd like to demonstrate this with a little live experiment, but my camera does not work. So I have to skip that. Um, and now comes just a few slides to for the people who are already a bit familiar with trapped ion quantum computing, so something for the experts maybe. So, so far I explained these, the principles, the basic ingredients that you need to understand trapped ion quantum computing, and now I'll show you um, how you can actually use it for real quantum computing. And okay, so now here we have such an ion string again, and we have our magnetic gradient field. And so this is the Hamiltonian that you get. So each ion has its own resonance frequency. And then we get uh, this magnetic gradient induced coupling. If you go through the mathematics, it gives you this spin spin coupling also so you can use this magic that i just showed you in different ways so this is one way of using it the spin spin coupling between i and i and i and j so the energy of one ion depends on the state of another ion so that's what this thing tells you and you couple all of the ions simultaneously so you have to sum over all I chase. Okay, so this crosstalk, uh, I just explained to you that works very well. So uh, in Sussex, for instance, even 10 to the minus eight crosstalk has been shown between two ions and here this, in this quantum byte, we had 10 to the minus five crosstalk. So this works extremely well, but then all, there's also this, um, this coupling here that you need for quantum gates and okay um, that allows you full connectivity between all of your ions. So, and this is something I'd like to point out now. Uh, using only two qubit gates and single qubit gates is probably not the most economical thing for real quantum computing. And I'd like to show you um, a few examples of quantum gates that were implemented using magic. And now the question is, how much time should I spend on this? So this is for our question for our chair session. Uh, session chair, sorry. 
Um, Please go ahead. We have 15 minutes left, including questions. Okay, excellent. Um, yes, so let me... Okay, so one thing, one recent experimental result that's quite interesting, I believe, because it's uh, it shows extremely robust gates um, using a dynamical decoupling sequence. So yes, what I'm saying now is more for the experts. So far, it was a very basic introduction. Now it's becoming a bit more technical. So dynamical decoupling is typically used to extend coherence times. And here we use it at the same time to implement a gate. And that is extremely robust. And I'll show you in a second experimental data um, that um, proves what I'm saying here. And an interesting feature is that you just need a single microwave field per qubit to implement this. So that's very economic and you can have shorter gate times because you use, if you do a two qubit gate, you use both um, mo motional modes of an ion crystal. And so you can make your gate faster. Okay, so just to show you the robustness. So this is robustness against motional excitation. So I told you, you have to use laser cooling to cool the motion of your ions but this is not always perfect and so what we we made it deliberately unperfect here so we go from a, a very nicely cooled state where we get uh, very high fidelities of gates to a very hot state so up to a hundred phonons excitation and so we don't see a real, really a decay of the fidelity within the error bars that we have here. So this uh, is a very encouraging result, making gates robust to uh, extremely robust to phonon excitation. And then, of course, you can do many things wrong in an experiment. You can choose the wrong trap frequency or not know exactly your trap frequency. And so what we did, we varied here the trap frequency by huge amounts. So typically people know much better than in the percentage range, know it much better what they have in their trap. So, but even at large uh, offsets, we see only small errors. And then we, what you also errors that can happen are when you apply pulse sequences, your timing is not perfect. And so we deliberately um, <clears throat> changed the Rabi frequency here, which is equivalent to changing the timing based on the length of your pulses, and also saw a very encouraging robustness here. Okay, so <clears throat> now this was two qubit gates, but I already mentioned that we can have multi qubit gates as well. And they can actually speed up your quantum algorithms considerably. So here, uh, a quantum Fourier transform, a coherent quantum Fourier transform was implemented on three qubits using this long range always on interaction. And it turns out that the full QFT algorithm can be implemented in a time that you would need otherwise for just a single two qubit C not gate. So using long range coupling can accelerate quantum algorithms. That's the message here. Then we implemented the Toffoli gate using this always on interaction. So the Toffoli gate is a th a uh, three qubit gate, a universal three qubit gate. So you can build any quantum algorithm using a Toffoli gate. So it's a conditional gate. So this qubit two to qubit two flips its state dependent on the state of qubit one and three. And okay, I cannot go into details here, but that's also a very economical gate because you only drive one qubit 
and then use this always on interaction here. So you only actively drive one qubit and get a three qubit gain. So that's, and then we extended this to, so if you add a single C not gate, then you have a, a half adder already. So an elementary element for computing. And just for comparison, if you would do this using two qubit gates, this would be the algorithm that you have to implement. So lots of two qubit gates, about 13, I think. So here's a two qubit gate, here's one, here's one, here's one, and so on. So instead of this, we just do this one toffoli gate and one C not gate in the end. So that's also a very economical way of implementing quantum computation using multi qubit gates. And then another thing that's, for, that's important for scaling up is um, you need to shuttle ions with and preserve their quantum state. So, and this works also extremely well with many nines of fidelity. So that's also very encouraging for future. Um, for future efforts for quantum computing. And so now I let me come to the next to the next the last slide. So this is um, places where magnetic gradient induced coupling is used very successfully, either using a static or oscillating magnetic gradient. So single qubit fidelities work have been shown with many nines, even more than this example. So I only show a few example impressive results. So this is from Bowler. Then two qubit gates have been done in Sussex, Oxford, Hanover, and also in Boulder with very high fidelity radio frequency gates. Coherence times have been shown on the order of 10 seconds for magnetically sensitive states. So for instance, in Siegen, Oxford, but also in Sussex and elsewhere. So this is um, this is using this magnetic gradient induced coupling is a <clears throat> thing to reckon with in the future when when it's when we think about scaling up trapped ion quantum computing to really useful quantum computers. I mean, then this will have uh, nice advantages. And now let me close with this slide here. So um, how do I get back to the slide here? That's, um, I don't want to flip to all, this, all of the slides, so I, I just started fresh to show you the final slide. So where is it? it? For some reason, it ended up somewhere in the middle. And okay, so yes, yeah, so one thing, one general thing about trapped ions is that they are always identical. So no matter where you are on the moon or Mars or Earth, you always have your perfect qubits ready. They are very well localized. They are laser cooled. They have long coherence times because they don't interact with the rest of the world. With RF gates, uh, very high fidelities have been obtained. Two qubit gates, high fidelities have been obtained. And yeah, so that's the final slide. So thank you very much for your attention. And hopefully there was something there that you could learn. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I think we don't have a lot of time, but I will still ask a couple of questions that were asked on uh, Discord. Um, so the first one, I guess it's an easier one. Could you, can you implement full connectivity between all the trapped ions? Uh, 
Yes and no. So what I showed you here is always one register containing a long string of ions. And yes, that is possible within one string. But then when you scale up, you need um, many strings and they will not, at one given point of time, they will not all be all to all connected. But the thing okay. is, like I showed in one register, you can already achieve uh, accelerated quantum algorithms by all to all connectivity. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is about dynamical decoupling sequences. How do we design them and how do we know how to find the optimal ones? Uh, very interesting question, yes. Um, Okay, so how do we design them? So that's a little science in itself, designing these decoupling sequences. So what I showed here, the particular thing about the decoupling sequences that I showed here is that the spacing between, uh, between decoupling pulses, the spacing in time uh, corresponds to the inverse frequency of your emotional modes. So uh, the decoupling frequency, uh, the decoupling pulses excite, excite the emotional modes in a right way. So that's the uh, design goal of these decoupling sequences here that we used here. Okay, um, and kind of a little bit related to this, um, in trapped ions, is there a way that we can do gates without this uh, entanglement or coupling between the spin and the motion of the ion? Um, okay, so not, not with, uh, if you use ground state qubits, because uh, the, the dipole, so you could use dipole-dipole coupling between magnetic moments, for instance, but this is extremely small. And it's not it's not useful for quantum computing. But what you can do is use Rydberg states. So that's what people are trying to do also. That interact via dipole-dipole interaction that is strong enough to have fast quantum gates. So if you go to Rydberg states, then you don't need the motional modes necessarily. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is about the three qubit gate that you briefly showed. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a fidelity for that? Like a number? Uh, yes, yes. So, okay, so I have a number for the, for the half adder. So that's, um, okay, let's see. That was the total half adder had a fidelity of around 60%. So this was not really great for quantum computing, but if you uh, if you compare it to a decomposition into C not gates, it corresponds to a fidelity of your C not gates of around 96 percent, which is still not great. Yeah. So this is a proof of principle experiment. It's not meant to be high fidelity. Okay, thank you very much. And um, maybe the last question is, are there any examples of any improvements on, uh, on the algorithm time of quantum computing that can help trap ion quantum computing? Um, on the algorithm side, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question again. <clears throat> um, okay, so what I showed here um, is, for instance, this QFT using the long range interaction, I would consider this an algorithmic development. Um, yes. And apart from that, yes. Yeah, so, so I think this, um, this is a, a very hot research topic and under the name of co-design basically. So, uh, yeah, so people are trying to take into account the strengths and weaknesses of certain implementations, uh, of certain physical implementations to speed up quantum algorithms, yes. 
Okay, thank you very much for your lecture and for answering all of these questions. The yeah, very last question much. needs to come from someone outside of the field. I will I will share the last question by Mohammad Reza from Iran. Uh, Mohammad Reza asks, is there anything disappointing about trapped ion quantum computing? Because everything sounds so great. Could you share with us? Uh, it's, I wouldn't say there's something disappointing. There are, there are, of course, technical hurdles that we need to overcome. And there are, uh, if you go into the details, uh, there are many technical hurdles that we still have to work on, but I wouldn't call it disappointing. I would call it a hurdle that we have to work on. So. That sounds like the, the right attitude and spirit. Thank you very much, Christoph, for this great presentation. This really gave insight into uh, trapped ion quantum computing and prepares us for the next uh, part of today's session, the virtual reality lab tour by Quantidium. Thank you, Christoph. And we, we look forward to collaborating more and we'll be in touch.